Celia. Right, so there we are. So it's really nice to welcome you all today to staring down the blank page um, in, with Forum. And it's, I'm actually Jessica Fellows, not Simon Jacques de Bueno. Uh, Simon, I'm, got to, I'm his wife right now, so I've got to use his Zoom. And I'm here with my great friend Celia Warden. Uh, and we were just remarking how we've sat across from each other in many situations, but never actually in a Zoom. No, no, and I hope we never do it again. No. <laughs> I know, but, it's all well, right. nothing against staff, but we're just the Zoom thing really is. So although, although having said that, as we were just saying just before, um, we tried, uh, Jessica and I tried it IRL again the other night, and actually, <laughs> in many ways, <laughs> Zoom is a lot more comfortable yeah. um, and warmer. Yeah, it's a little bit, yes. Although we're missing the martini class, it's very strange to talk to you without martini in my hand. Um, so Celia and I have, um, we, we, we've been friends for a long time. We first met when we were working at Night and Day magazine at the Mail on Sunday. And we both left at the exactly the same time. I went off to Country Life magazine. Celia went to the Telegraph. And then we've had lots of coincidences in our lives, not least of which we both met our husbands at the same time. We got engaged on the same day which was really bizarre. And I just would like to confirm that Piers and Simon have been seen in the same room at the same time. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> um, but the really nice coincidence is that we're now both being published by Sphere for our crime novels. So you've got your debut thriller, not your debut novel, novel but your debut thriller, Payday, coming out in September with Sphere. And we're joined today by Rosanna, who edited Celia's books. And uh, and fact, Rosanna edited my last Mitford, the Mitford trial, because my uh, editor was away on paternity leave at the time. So, you know, it's just been really nice, full circle. So we're just going to chat for 20 minutes and then we'd love to, but we'd love to take questions from anybody at any time, really. Just put your questions in the chat box uh, or put your hand up and let me know that you want to, that you want to say something. And Edward Wood, oh, Edward Wood. So that's my editor. He's joined, joined as well. So it's great to have lots of people. So I thought we would talk about, um, well, we can talk about a few things really. I was quite tempted to tell everyone about the boiled sweet car, just because <laughs> that was when we first started working, Celia and I, we were put together as um, a sort of party columnist. And, but also we would do these stories where the two of us would go off and we'd have to sort of track down someone famous. So we'd first, our first one was David Beckham and all his teammates when he was 10 years old which was quite easy because they all still lived in the same bit of West East London, didn't they? Where was yeah. it? Yeah. They all still lived there. Anyway, we used to drive around. Celia had a car that looked like a boiled sweet uh, and it worked really well apart from the fact that the doors didn't open. And so you could only get in and out of it through the boot. So we would sort of go and do a long interview with someone and say bye and they'd stand at the door saying bye, we go bye. <laughs> They go bye, and then they'd watch us <laughs> climb into this car <laughs> through the bridge. Yes, not yeah, we've stayed that professional ever since. I think it's you know it's quite good, really. Mm -hmm. So, what do you to tell us? Your you're writing a lot, Celia, as I as I know. At the moment, you've got a weekly column with the Telegraph, and you usually do another interview in the week, also, yeah. and you're doing your novel. So, yes. you know, how's it going? <laughs> <laughs> wow. you, you forgot the homeschooling. Um, yeah, it's, sorry. Uh, it's, thank goodness at an end for the moment. Um, but, uh, well, actually, I was thinking, uh, I, I feel quite lucky because I do, the, the, there's something immediately fulfilling about journalism because, you know, you've got the adrenaline pumping, you've got until 4 p.m. to write 1,500 words, and then you get it done and it's in the paper the next day and everybody's forgotten about it the day after. And, um, and that, they're, they're, that is quite fulfilling in a kind of fast paced type way. Yeah, um, and also you do interact occasionally with another human being, which obviously you don't do as a writer. <laughs> and so, so, so I feel I do have the best of both worlds because, because I enjoy sort of plunging myself into a book um, uh, because I, because I have those moments. But I think if I were really sort of in just in one room writing one book after another, I, I do think that would get quite lonely probably. Find that. Although, I mean, the way it's what's been so nice for me 
has been um, you getting more into the novel writing recently because it's meant we've I mean, we will email each other, sometimes we'll email each other sort of, you know, 10, 15 times in a day, kind of very short, quite silly email. Sometimes it's only really about online shopping. <laughs> Shall I buy this or not? But I love that. But it's given me that sense of being with a colleague all day, which has been really nice. You've definitely yeah. made my writing life a lot less lonely from that point of view. And then recently we've been talking more about our novels. Yes. And I think also the, the, the kind of mad questions that two novelists ask each other. I mean, if you listen to any of our conversations in a, in a, in a pub, you, if you were sitting at the next door table, you would think we were completely insane because, uh, because you're talking for a start about people who don't exist. Um, and, and, uh, um, and, and I do you're, like it when you email me things like and say, um, you know, can, can we have this woman... Be, be this weird look like this and you know sort of how many ways can you kill someone with with a letter opener you know th th would this one be sort of acceptable? Yeah. those kind of even you know they're, they're great yes or, or kind of or what kind of uh you know what kind of books would would a woman of 42 who who wears clothes from me and m buy or you know just completely yeah. mad things um, and uh, um, but uh, but I do think that those are the you know quite often we'll immediately have the answer to each other's problems uh, and so when you come into a sort of knotty bit where you just can't can't really see the wood for the trees it's so helpful to just talk to someone outside of the story um, and say you know what would this person do here or would you most importantly would you buy this if you were reading it <laughs> Yeah, you know, not just buy this, but but would you, you know, would 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 you suspend disbelief to this point? And yeah. I know Jessica will always say to me, you know, if she'll be honest and say, absolutely not. Um, so um, that's so the thing. I think that's the hardest thing as a writer is knowing who your honest reader is. I mean, for me, because Simon will get very cross because I give him the book to read, and then he's he's very nice about it. But then I think, well. He has to be, or I'll divorce him, kind of thing. Yeah. So, you know, and then you feel like you're. Sometimes you feel like your editors have to be nice to you because they've hired you to write the book in the first place. You know, so they've got to kind of coach. So you need that person who's going to say honestly, this just isn't. This just isn't working. Yes. Yes. Um, absolutely. And uh, but I think also just to. Um, I mean, uh, talking of Rosanna, for example, when she edits, <laughs> I love her notes. And Jessica and I were laughing about you the other day, Rosanna, because. We were saying not only do you say you know this bit needs to be tweaked or maybe clarify who, but then occasionally Rosanna gets so into it that she'll she'll put something like you know God he's so awful exclamation yeah, love that. To someone. and um and that's great because it means <laughs> you really mind yeah 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 exactly how what what's the I mean, when I first knew you, in fact, you were writing your first novel. I remember being incredibly impressed when we were at Night and Day magazine. We were doing our late night parties uh, and reporting on them. You'd be getting up at six and writing your your novel, Harm's Way. Um, so how has is, how is that the, the nature of that writing changed for you, do you think, since you did that, since those very, very early days of writing a novel? What's different in you, in you as you write them, do you think? Well, I'm sure it'll be the same with you in that when you're younger you think that writing is this terribly poetic thing where you have to be looking out over an ocean preferably, <laughs> and you know smoking enormous amounts of cigarettes and and all the things that actually don't help at all um, <laughs> and in fact it kills you but um but, but so 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 uh, and, yeah. but also just no structure whatsoever just thinking it was all about um you know when the genius takes you and that will be yes. enough yes and then you, for the muse Yes, and you very quickly realise that uh, there, that you just have to sit down and put one word in front of another. Um, and I remember there was that great quote from Salman Rushdie with somebody was asking him on Twitter how to. There was a whole a whole load of people asking him how how do I become a writer? And um, he said, well, it's actually very easy. All you have to do is start the book and get to the bit where you write the end. <laughs> no, that's it. But don't you think a lot of that discipline comes from our journalism background, though? The fact that you're the fact that you you have to write your fifteen hundred word features in a day means you know you can write fifteen hundred words in a day. So once you've got that physical ability, that sort of backs you to get get to the end of it. Nevertheless, we do have those days when you just can't get past five hundred day five hundred words. Yes. What do you think? Why do you think that happens? What's happening for you when you don't get past five hundred words on the day when you really need to? 
I think I think maybe being too precious about your words is the is is the problem there. And actually, journalism because because we all know it's fish and chips paper. The next day, um, if you've been doing it long enough, you know you 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 bang it out. And in fact, often just the the, the fact that you have to bang it out makes it better than one of those things you sort of obsess over. Um, yeah. uh, you know. Um, in the same way that that I think sort of a woman looks much better without too much makeup, but if she's had five hours to get ready, she often looks less pretty than if she. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, do you find? I mean, I find I'm at my most productive about an hour and a half before I know I absolutely have to stop. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. It just does come down to deadlines in the end. Did you have any? Um, what you know what for you was the transition from non-fiction to fiction what did you find hard or or easy about about that um I I I didn't enjoy I wrote a book about George Best called I should explain called Babysitting George which was based on um the, uh, the weirdest journalistic assignment um uh perhaps not of all time but of my life certainly um where I was sent to live with George Best after he'd had his liver transplant um, and his whole life had gone off the rails and his wife had left him. He was he was sort of sleeping with several women um, uh, and um, all of whom were intermittently selling their papers to the Daily telling selling their stories to the Daily Star or the Sun. And um, I was with the mail at the time and I was sent to babysit him, which was which meant to stop him from talking to any other newspaper because he belonged to us supposedly um and that <laughs> and that was very very strange so so I wrote a book about it um just after he died um and actually I just found the thing of of having real uh, of tackling real people especially someone as sort of adored as he was uh really hard work in the end um and it's so much more fun and liberating I found to 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 be able to to write about fictional people but do you have you found it I just sometimes find I found in the uh, sort of the first few novels not so much now but in the first few novels and I've got the same sort of thing where I'm dealing with real people in my in my books um oh. so a lot of what I do has to be backed up with historical research and so on then I've got my fictional characters but I, I kept sometimes you think I really just want to be able to look this person up and then just use those qualities. Yeah. It's just quite hard to imagine it. I and mean, when we have, you and I know, we've both done it with our characters. We find photographs of people <laughs> and kind of use them. You know, I've always got them photographed on oh, yes. of what uh, I think my characters look like. You I won't show you, I won't show you the ones I've got there. I was thinking of Shane, but then it's got someone that we both know. <laughs> <laughs> who, who I think is absolutely awful and he and he and he's the he's the um he's the main villain of my new book just I mean facially and and sort yeah, of his really. characteristics but actually I remember my husband getting in, incredibly worried because the uh, payday um the book uh, that I've just finished that's coming out in September is uh the um the main character in many ways in terms of his facial expressions and the way he behaves uh, was sort of very very loosely based on Jamie Theakston but but not at all his character just physically um and so i had on my desktop various youtube um videos of Jamie <laughs> As well, as well as sort of you know pictures there and my husband came up to ask me something one day and said what what is going on with you and Jamie Theakston is there something I should know about okay, I know um, but it is that, it's that question that one gets asked all the time you know is it is it based on anything in real life and you always you know you, I know we both have had you know you feel a bit of caution sometimes about putting in a certain story in case people think this is a, a, a reflection of what is actually happening to you but the truth is you do bet quite a lot in real life don't you you can't help it I mean, no no but I think bits of so you know you might have of, yes but you've not one whole picture you have no. not one person you've just completely transplanted exactly I think that's where people get things wrong because they they think yes you've just summed up someone when in fact it might be a snapshot from a party of the yeah. way a wife has behaved towards her husband, you know, combined with your next door neighbor, combined with someone you yeah. were at school with. Something you um, saw once. 
yeah exactly exactly so we've got a question here for, and i'd love to get some more questions from anyone question from paul nuda um he says how do you get to the point of putting the first sentence on paper and does it survive the night the first mm -hmm. sentence well, anyway. it's a good question really that very blank sheet of paper how blank what's the blankest sheet of paper you've ever written on you know with the first sentence i mean mm -hmm. paid, actually payday remember the story Talk, tell the tell us the story of how you thought of payday in the first place because it came to you what the um the, yes well you were um, going to talk about another book with your agent and then you said literally in almost in the moment of standing up to say yeah. hello. well that's why i mean again going back to the journalism just the this the sort of stimuli that you get from from everywhere from interviews you might have done combined with all sorts of other things so i i um uh had been interviewing lots and lots of people involved with me too um, from lawyers to uh, people at, at, at the start, people who were defending sort of Weinstein to, to some of the victims. Um, and um, I became quite fascinated by uh, how, how the, the narrative around it changed over time. So at first there was this, at first of all, we, nobody really believed whether it was true or not. Then suddenly all the women piled in. Then there was this sort of reckoning where a lot of people, myself included, said, well, hang on a second, let's not, you know, not all men are sort of like, like Harvey Weinstein, can we just slightly reel it back from there? Mm -hmm. And, um, and it was the shades of grey that all of us were talking about over a pint that I just wasn't seeing anywhere. Um, and I think people love shades of grey, particularly in a, in a thriller, and they also like to disagree. Um, uh, and so the idea, you know, that those those, the things I love the most are the, are the, the ones where I'm like Dr. Foster, where I'm arguing with my husband on the sofa and he's saying, no, he didn't deserve that. And yeah. I'm saying, yes, he did. And, then, and so that was, that was how it came about. You do get that, I think, with your journalism as well. I think you probably get a really quick litmus test of what people are thinking. Yes. You know, in, in response to something. And you know, my favorite day of the week is, is and your worst probably, is Monday when you're when you've got to write the column but when you email me first thing in the morning you know I'm thinking maybe I could <laughs> say this and I never know you know sometimes I've you know when I'm fired up with loads of kind of answers back to that and then, yes. you know that may maybe makes you think oh, okay in that case this could be something everyone's getting yes about. exactly do you are you getting lots of um still lots of text messages from people over the weekend still getting kind of het up about about things or do you think now lockdown's sort of lifting everyone's getting a little bit less intense about what's happening in the news well i think uh, well the royal thing is just uh, that people i don't think that's ever gonna get less intense from certainly with telegraph readers who really mind about that um, um but uh, but i uh, i think there were yeah there was a hot house feeling wasn't there during lockdown um and um and it is interesting that writers found it so hard to write there was a very was you sent me that very good piece in the guardian a while back yeah. with lots of uh, sort of booker prize winning authors who just said that they weren't being stimulated by normal things enough um well yeah i think i think it's a combination of that thing it's a combination of not being able to just go to a cafe and overhear conversation just see other people just observe someone other than yeah. your own immediate family but i think also that as much as I completely, I, you know, I completely agree with you that when you need to write, you just have to sit down and, and get writing. There isn't a muse to write. At the same time, you need a kind of fairly happy, relaxed state of mind. And that's, that's what I found really difficult, particularly at the beginning of the lockdown, when you just all you wanted to do was look at the news every five minutes and see yes. what had yes. changed, what had been updated, what someone was saying. And it just, just couldn't, just couldn't clear that kind of, no, actually, yeah, sort of white noise, and 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 uh, and of course there was the one um, the one uh, writer in that piece that you sent over who was a, I can't remember who it was, but she writes sort of very sexy books, and um, she'd said that, that she would be in the middle of writing these sort of unbelievably, you know. Um, hot passages and suddenly her child would come in and go so mum if you're dividing this and then she was I, I just can't do this this is not going to work for me um, yeah. which is yeah. you know, thank goodness I'm not writing that book <laughs> 
So we've got a couple of questions have come in uh, as direct messages. So Louisa Baldini, who who did some, who's in the lovely green top and did the brilliant translation for you of your Sophia Loren interview. Thank you, I know. Um, you see how we all work together. That's what's so nice. Louisa is a journalist as well. Um, Louisa says, you spoke of taking episodes and characters from real life. Do you write notes as you go about your daily business when you see vignettes or snapshots of life? Do you want to include in your writing? Do you take notes? I've never asked you that before. You know, little uh, from daily life. From daily yeah, life, when, when an idea occurs, how do you hold on to it? Yes, I do. Um, I do. If anyone else read any of the post its that I have sitting around, they would think I, I was mad. But uh, I, I mean, little you don't post it to think that, Celia. No, that's true. That is true. <laughs> no, but I mean, I think little things like I remember going to a party, um, uh, I think not, it can't have been last Christmas, the Christmas before. Um, and, uh, and talking to a husband and wife that we know, um, and somebody jogged the husband's elbow and he spilt his champagne on her shoes. And there was a quick glance between the two of them where you could, where everything about their relationship could be explained because he, he was scared and she was furious and you knew it was going to come up later that night, either yeah. in the taxi or when that, you know, you ruined my shoes. And, it, and, and and I just thought, oh, that, that I immediately right. wrote down. Um, because right. you, but you yeah. have another advantage, of course, which is that you interview people all the time. So you have sort of license to ask questions. <laughs> yeah. Um, who's, been, who's been one of your best interviewees recently? I mean, I know you're, I was, you're, you're a fan of the old ladies, which I love. You love Joan Collins. Um, well, I think they're and, you know, proper people, proper, you know, and proper stars. Sophia Loren was Sophia Loren, you know, was pretty amazing. Um, and she she was she'd been isolating and only seeing occasionally her son. And I said, "How are you managing to get through it?" And she said, "Well, I have a, uh, a the Sophia Loren method. She talks about herself in the third person, as you would expect, which, <laughs> um, <laughs> which uh, was to to put on old Fred Astaire movies and dance along." Um, oh. to do routines and I just thought you see if we all did that we'd probably be fine <laughs> that's all you need that's all you need uh, and I've had another question from Charlotte Norris who, who's our forum team um, Charlotte says when you're writing fact and fiction together do you ever worry about where to draw the line yeah 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 that's a very very good question um, I mean I think uh, uh, I think luckily the kind of interviews I do, I, I, I know exactly, yes. And I think it's a, it's a, what, what can be tricky and you have to remind yourself is particularly sometimes in the same day you might go from, at the moment, for example, today, I went from researching an actress I'm going to interview tomorrow to writing my book. And, um, and I think sometimes in your head, the two things can sort of get mixed up and you- okay. Yeah. Um, but then, uh, um, and or you can be tempted to sort of dramatize um, uh, aspects of an interview with someone. But then, I mean, that's also a part of journalism is to pick out the very juiciest bits of a chat with somebody and make sure that you're that you're you, you know titillating the reader as well as 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 well as telling the truth, obviously. That's hard, isn't it? I mean, I can remember Jo Malabar, or do you remember the deputy editor of Night and Day yeah. magazine, and she would send us off with these interviews. I was always hopeless at interviews. You were always really good at them. Um, but I sort of, I remember once saying to her, that, well, I don't understand why they've chosen some really awful writer to interview someone. And, and, the, and she said, you just don't get it, do you? It's not about the writing. Right. Oh, you don't care about the writing. So what do you care about? What is it you want? She said, I want them either to tell you something that they've never told anybody, not even their best friend, which is yeah. to tell a Mail on Sunday journalist within an hour, <laughs> you like, one of your biggest secrets. Uh, or she said, get them to slag someone off in their own yes. uh, field of you know work. Just, that's the, that's yeah. the holy grail, basically. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it's quite tricky because you're aware that, that the sub editors will write headlines. You know, do you remember we? I mean, we had it quite a few times where the sub editors yeah. write something was like, that wasn't actually the point I was trying to make in no. the interview. It was early clickbait, I guess. Yeah. Now what clickbait is? Yeah. But really, what do you think has really changed in journalism since we first started? 
Well, I think you've just said it in, in terms of because everyone can now, um, you know, within a day or not even within hours, um, mm. my editor will know exactly how, how, how many times a piece I've written has been viewed, how long people have spent reading it, whether they've you know, quickly gone on to something else. And so, you know, they there feed are these... that information. Do they feed that back to you and say this has been a successful piece and this? Yeah, absolutely. That. And and so, but the problem with that is that obviously, um, you know, it can reduce everything to one topic. So if I write about Meghan Markle, it will get an enormous amount of hits online because it's, it's her. Fun. It's got nothing to do with anything I've written or my writing. It's right. just because it's her. Right. Um, and um, and that and so ultimately, you know, it it can. Be problematic because you can end up just um, if you only do it for that then then you will end up writing about the same sort of three things over and over again so what do you how do you tackle that with your editors how do you prevent that from happening from them just saying only Meghan Markle articles from now on well I mean I'm lucky because I think they they um, you know are not they know that telegraph readers are um, intelligent uh, human beings and nuanced people who uh, I mean, I'm not going to compare them to, <laughs> to <laughs> other <laughs> readers. Readers, but, yeah. um, but, uh, but I think that they, uh, um, are, crucially, they're not actually mean people at all. Um, and so if they feel that you've, you've gone in too hard or you've been unfair to someone, they always let you know. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, um, and and I think also that, that you know, they have a very big breadth of, of interest so so luckily uh, for the moment um you know we are okay with that but i think it i mean that's a problem generally with every publication are you are you putting forward lots of ideas for who you would like to interview are you just sort of making sure you get your balance that way do you suggest yes i mean i don't i i just uh, always want to go for the old people i think everyone i don't think anyone should ever interview someone beneath the age of 20 really because <laughs> What on earth could they possibly have to tell us all? Um, but uh, and, you know, unfortunately, that does cancel out sort of lots of the Hollywood starlets and so on. So you, yeah. So. Well, we've talked. A lot, I know we've talked a lot. Where I'm always trying to dissuade you from interviewing actors any any further. Um, only because as I get older, I'm less interested in reading. I always don't want to watch their films. Yes. I'm less interested in reading the interviews. And also, aren't you prohibited from asking so many questions now? Hasn't that changed too? Well, oh, yes, that's quite right. Yeah, the, the, it has become so um, overly sort of managed and guarded now. So, for example, the actress I'm going to interview tomorrow, there'll be four other people present while I interview her. Four. Um, Four. It's on Zoom because she's in LA. Um, but even even face to face now, there will quite often be at least one. Um, with any of the big American stars, there there will always be at least one. Um, when I interviewed Beyonce, there were three, and she also brought along her own video recorder to video me asking her the questions in case oh, okay. there was in any, case there was any sort of discussion. Yes, yes. So does that? What does that? Does that? affect you in the way that you interview them or have you managed to kind of well I think the only way interviews really work is if you have a if you have any kind of normal human dynamic and it's very hard to have one um, with, <laughs> yeah. that, with, with that sort of thing going on um, uh, but then I get it because from their point of view with with social media there's actually in a way there's no upside at all to them giving interviews um, I'm surprised that they, they still exist yeah yeah, exactly. Well, thanks. That's that's Hubbard five. That's thirty minutes. I could go on, as you know, for another four and a half hours. You know, with a few more martinis uh, to ease us on the way. Let's hope Next we see time. that again soon. So, just a big thank you to everybody for um, joining us. I'm going to put it on gallery view again. It's really nice to see you all, and thank you very much for joining us. Hope you found that interesting. Thank you so much, lovely Celia, uh, and get Celia's book in September, Payday, published by Smith. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, thank you Jessica. Thank you. Thank you.